Ain't got no home or no place to roam. Ain't got no home or no place to roam. I'm a lonely boy. I ain't got a home. I got a voice. I love to sing. I sing like a girl and I sing like a frog. I'm a lonely boy. I ain't got a home. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana at March the 19th, 1937. That's across the river. And uh, we lived in New Orleans on New Orleans Street till 1948. And that's when my daddy moved over here in Algiers. My daddy was named Clarence Henry Sr. And my mother was named Einstein Henry, Einstein Harrison Henry. I had four sisters. I'm the one brother, and uh, my only sister, Mama sent her to play piano, and uh, I went with her, and she came back and told Mama she didn't like you know, playing piano, so I told Mama, send me, you know, I'll show you what I'll do for 50 cents, you know, because it was 50 cents a lesson by Miss Jones on Columbus and Claiborne. I was 11 years old. I used to sell snowballs and peanut and candy and stuff. My daddy paid me nothing when I was young. Then my daddy started giving me a, a dime, a dime from 12 to eight at night or so. Then my daddy, get, the most my daddy gave me for working for him was a quarter. You hear what I say? I was up in age, up to 15, my daddy gave me a quarter. And what happened when I was 15 to 18, I worked in a service station, Sean Hart on a station wagon on General Purgeon and Claiborne. I made $25 a week. My mama gave me $1 out my $25. And guess what? I didn't complain because I worked for mama and dad, you know. I got a piano in there when I was 15 years old. My mama had me to buy that piano and pay for it, 600 and some more dollars. Yeah, they made me pay. No, they didn't make me, but mama had me to pay for it. My daddy was a musician, uh, uh, what we call a mother wit musician. He never taken a listen, but he can play guitar, any string instrument, ukulele, uh, harmonica, and piano, you know, and uh, I guess I inherited it from him, <laughs> and I started playing the piano. I taught myself my my style, you know. I taught myself that I, if I was blind like Ray Charles, that I could play the piano, you know. I was playing the piano around at L.B. Landry High School, and a, a secretary, when the principal and the teacher was in a meeting, she didn't know my name. But I was banging on them piano, so she said, a little boy with the red and black jacket come and entertain the student bodies, you know, that would have assembly with the student. And I would play the boogie woogie, a fast domino, and Professor Longhair. I even bought a wig and had two plaits, like, <laughs> like with long hair, you know. And Mr. William Houston was my band director. He put me in the band, L.B. Landry High School Band. And uh, I didn't know how to hold a trombone, but I, I played a third trombone the first year. And uh, three years I played first trombone. And uh, so he put me with the band with Bobby Mitchell. I'm gonna be a wheel someday. I'm gonna be somebody. I'm gonna be a real gone cat. And I won't want you. And I stayed with Bobby for you. Years when I was about 17 years old, we would go to Gonzales, Sorrento, and all that Baton Rouge, all around the city. And uh, so, one 
and 55, I had to get married April the 1st, and I was supposed to play with Bobby, and I couldn't make the jobs, so I, when I got married, Bobby didn't give me no more work, you know. My first wife, she was 14 years old, and I was 18, I just made 18, and I really loved her. I wanted one wife, you know, that's the way I came up in my mind. And uh, so what happened, my wife <laughs> told me to go back to my mama and daddy, you know, because her parents were well off, you know. They, her daddy worked in the Navy yard and her mama was working in the hospital down in the ninth ward, you know. And so I tried, to, eight years it took me, I tried, I used to just look at her, you know, and, uh, but she didn't want me, you know. I even bought a car. And that's when I got with another band. The guy came to the cutoff by my aunt and got me to play with uh, Warren Payne, Benny, Benny Cumming, and uh, two other guys from Gretna. And we started playing at the old Joy Lounge. But the Fat Man first, we started playing in at, at Oakdale, they call it Oakdale, where the project is now. And uh, I was making five dollars a night for four hours, and then I got a raise. I played at Bill Chicken Shack on Elmira Street. I was making seven dollars a night. So what happened? A guy from the old Joy Lounge in Gretna, Pots Marcella, he came in to Bill Chicken Shack and he heard me singing. So he told me he wanted me to play in his club. So which I went there with. Uh, Eddie Smith, I went there with uh, Warren Payne and them, but then he got rid of the band and put me with Eddie Smith, Eugene John, and Walter Epps. And I played at the Joy Lounge for years, you know. Fast Domino was my idol. He really was, I, I want, when the uh, disc jockey would play his number, I would learn the song and go into the club that night and start singing it, you know. Professor Longhair, you know, he, he was great. And uh, me and my brothers, we used to sneak in the bars, you know, go in the bars and listen to him. He would play music with two keys on a piano. I mean, he would kick that piano and play it. Everybody loved him, you know. Those, those was my guy that, that in, in, Press me to play music, you know. Ooh, ain't got no home. I know play the wrong. Ain't got no home. I so one night I was working overtime. I must have started about eight, nine o'clock, and it was about eight in the morning. <laughs> and I was getting tired, but I respected my leader, Eddie Smith. And then every time it was time for us to get off, the, the proprietor would go outside because this club was packed. I hit a riff on that piano, bam! Ooh, ain't got no home. <laughs> I was trying to tell the people, y'all go home so we can get off, you know. And that's how I made Ain't Got No Home. Paul Gayton, I played it for him, and he sent the disc to uh, Leonard Chess. And Leonard Chess and Bobby, Bobby Charles came down and they heard me at, at the club, and he told Paul to put me in the studio and record Ain't Got No Home. And Ain't Got No Home was a sleeper. So it, was a, it wasn't on a regular record, it was on a trial disc. I ain't got a mother, I ain't got a father. And the leading disc jockey here in New Orleans, Papa Stopper, was playing it. And the people in New Orleans was requesting the song. Play this frog song by the frog man. They didn't know my name or the name of the song. And I was in the studio and Papa Stopper said, from now on, your name is frog man. So that's how I got my name, frog man. Well, 
Ain't Got No Home, when I made Ain't Got No Home, went to New York and, and all around, the, you know, for a whole year. I thought the sun would shine, you know, that I would be out there for the rest of my life with Ain't Got No Home. <laughs> but I stayed out there a year and it brought me back into New Orleans, you know, in, in 1958. And, uh, and what happened, I prayed. I say, Lord, I say, I thought, you know, everything would shine like gold, you know, for the rest of my life. So when it started raining, I said, if you give me one more chance, I'll show you what I'll do with my money. And so in 1961, in 60, Leonard, Leonard Chess came down. I was playing at the Court of Two Sister Tavern. And he, he came there and he said, you're going to record tomorrow. I said, record? I don't have no, no song or nothing. So Bobby Charles and Paul Gayton, we had a song, But I Do, on the shelf. And we went in the studio and recorded that. And we got Alan Toussaint, you know. He was the a and man then, you know. And But I Do was a big hit. The Coda Two Sisters, Ivanhoe, uh, the Five Forty Four, the La Strada, the Five Hundred, the Five Hundred Backstage. What happened? I was playing at the Moonlight Rouge in Marrero with a Catman and Diaz, you know, trumpet musician. And uh, so when we left Marrero Club, we were walking down Bourbon Street looking for a job. And the guy, Frank Caracci, was out there barking, you know, trying to get people to come in the club. So they say, do you need an a, a entertainer, you know? And Frank Caracci said, no, I don't need no band. He said, uh, but we got, you know, this frog man. And he remembered me from Canal Street, you know. And uh, he gave me a job. He put me on the stage. He didn't need me after the cat girl, you know. And they paid me $10 then, you know, at that time, you know. And then I went off with Chuck Berry. And I, I did 31 dates with Chuck Berry. Chuck and I were great friends, you know. I had the same thing with uh, Etta James <laughs> with Chuck. Because we went to Texas. <laughs> and uh, the first time I, put, I had the band behind Chuck in Texas. And uh, I would get up there and i say, now, ladies and gentlemen, we bring Mr. Maybelline Chuck, Chuck Berry. <laughs> Chuck would come on there. Chuck would, get, when he finished, he didn't walk off. He didn't bring me on. <laughs> he did that a couple of times. So when I went on stage and when I came off, I didn't introduce him. <laughs> and uh, so I just walked off the stage and Chuck called New York on me. He said, Frogman would not introduce me. You know, and from then on, Chuck and I were great friends. We traveled together, you know, we played together many years. And Etta James was my buddy, you know, because that was, that was a story about Etta James and I. We, uh, Leonard Chess were, were working at the Howard Theater, and uh, I was going for the first day. Ray Charles was on the show in the impression, and Etta, Etta James. But Etta was recording, so she missed the first date. And so Lennon brought me through the studio, and she, he said, uh, Etta, this is Frogman. <laughs> and Etta said, like, you know, so what, you know? <laughs> and so what happened when she got to Washington, D.C. on the show, I would come off the stage, and she'd go on, and I would not speak to her. And she come here, and she said, come here, come here, you. <laughs> and she crushed me. <laughs> See, I know why you're not speaking, this, but I'm sorry. And Etta and I were the best friends there ever was. You know, I love Etta. Etta was an entertainer that I never forget at the Brooklyn Paramount. I stood up there, listened to her sing at last, and chilled this. Looked like I got the Holy Ghost. You know, chilled went through my body. I call him my dad, you know. He, he was an influence to me. He, he, he taught me a lot about my career. Um, he, he helped me with my lifestyle. He told me he didn't want me 
out there in the quarters, 80, 90 years old, you know, and uh, different thing that he did for me, you know, we was like a family. I, I go to his house. My daddy came over here. I called him my daddy. And he came over, he told me buy all this land around, you know, my house. And I didn't have a penny, but he helped me. He sent me to a bank, you know, to get uh, a loan. And that's how I got the property that I got because of him. He helped me through my career. That's how I got to be, you know, strong. Yeah, he was, he was the best club owner that respected my work. Always put the one you love, the one you shouldn't hurt at all. Leonard Chess had sent me a dub for me to learn a song, I'm a Fool to Care. And I'm sitting here learning the words and how to sing the song. I pop Joe Berry. <laughs> He recorded the song, <laughs> and so we well we couldn't do the song. I'm a fool to care because Joe Berry had it. So Leonard brought Alan Two Cent and myself, and brought us to Chicago, and we, and we recorded. Uh, you always hurt the one you love in Chicago, and it turned out to be a big hit. Long the Street came after. Uh, you, you always hurt the one you love. Leonard was just pushing out there, and Bobby Charles was writing them, you know. And uh, I, I recorded a lot of songs written by Bobby Charles, Alan Toussaint, and different one, Paul Gayton, mm -hmm. and myself, you know. I, I, I made up a lot of songs like Old Mickey. But the Apollo was great, you know, because I enjoyed doing the Apollo. I played with Roy Hamilton and the heartbeats and different one, and uh, the leading disc jockey in New York was, at that time was Jocko. You know, I did the Jocko show, and we we made a, we set a record there with the tenants, you know? And uh, I did a lot of shows at the Apollo. And what happened, the old man, Mr. Shipman, he did wonders for a lot of entertainers. He made them, you know, he, he changed me. Cause I was playing the piano, and and wouldn't stand up, and he got me away from the piano, and started singing standing up. Mm -hmm. I told England years before then. Uh, what happened when I first went to England? I stayed over there six months with uh, Cannon and Ball. You know, I did tours six months over there with them. Then I did Scarborough, and then I did the, all, the whole island, down in Wales and Scotland, you know, and the, even Ireland, you know. I went over to Ireland, I stayed over there. What happened, I had a band, and I was traveling with the band, and I never forget, they were, they were going around there, and I, I said, oh, uh, look at that circle, you know. But they don't call it a circle, they call it roundabout, you know and different little things, but I, I really enjoy England. I, I met the Beatles before there was the Beatles in Piccadilly Circle, they was playing in a club. Up, I can see the club now upstairs and it was called something else. My manager, Bob Astor, bought the Beatles over here. They was with GAC. And uh, so Bob put me with the Beatles I met them in Philadelphia. I had 18 dates with them. I had 21 days with them, but we did 18 dates in the United States and Canada, Montreal and Toronto, you know. And uh, we had three days down in Key West, Florida, off. We you know, had three days off. And we had a jam session down there. And during the tour, you know, Paul McCarthy and I was real, and the guy that played with, uh, sang with Bill Black Combo, we were great, must did. we were great friends, you know. And I saw, whatever I saw, it was so strange. They had doctors, Emmeline's and everything at these shows, you know. And it was, it was 
security was so great, you know. And uh, what happened, <laughs> a girl in, in Dallas, Texas, I'll never forget, the crowd was so bad they pushed her straight in the glass. I mean, she went through a glass plate at a hotel. You know, it was all cut up. Mm -hmm. In New Orleans, the policeman was playing football with the kids. They had broken the barrier, and the policemen were tackling them while the show was going on. And that's when the Beatles met Fast Domino. And my manager, Bob Astor, said, uh, Fast, said, what, what do you think about the Beatles? She said, man, them cats talk, they talk funny, <laughs> you know. Fast Domino was comical. Yeah, he said the Beatles talk funny. When the, when the long hair came here for the British invasion, <laughs> I was working at a, a club. Uh, it was the club on Bourbon Street, and I forgot the name of it, for the guy that, that had the 544. And the guy wanted me to leave, you know, my friend, my best man. And I told him no, you know, and they had a, a man was pushing that long hair music in there, and you know, and I told him he can have it. You know, I quit the job, you know. I wouldn't take the job, but they, they was hurting us. You know, the long hair music, they was hurting the rhythm and blues guys. Well, people start liking the rock and roll back again, you know. And Rolling Stone and I, Mick Jagger and I, I, I played a birthday party for him on the president in the boat. You know, they, they was enthused over Frogman, you know. Oh, my band, Al Beamers and uh, uh, Mike Pierce and Clinton Charlotte and Warren Nabon, we've been together over 25 years you know, since 75 or more, you know, and we were like family. I didn't, musician, I respect musician because I was a side man. And I paid my musician like really 500, six, 800, a thousand dollars for maybe an hour or two. I, you know, I didn't give no musician $10 or thing when I first started out. People were paying the musician on, traveling on the road fifteen dollars a night. I paid mine eighteen. You know that was in '57. You know, I respected musician. I I I I feel for them, and I had love for them. And I didn't have too many bands in my career. I might have had about three different bands in my career. And that's the one when I started at the Old Joy Lounge, the Court of Two Sisters, you know, from the Court of Two Sisters to the 544, and from the 544 to the La Strada, those were my musicians. happened with the Russ Limbaugh, uh, they had a guy, I think his daddy had Danny and Clyde over here. He told me, he came here, he said, Frog Man, he says, the guy playing your song on the television and uh, a radio. And I said, would you like to meet him? Well, I, I, I had a lot of invitation, you know, it come in this ear and out uh, that one. I said, yeah. So I met. Russell Limbaugh at the fairground here in New Orleans. Then he said he would like me to do a show with him. And so I told him, yeah. He sent for me in the band. And we did the show there in California. After the show, he said, Fro man, he said, I'd like you to do a cruise. We did an eight day cruise in the Caribbean with Russ Limbaugh and played one song and had the opportunity of enjoying ourselves for the rest. 
And after Russell Limbaugh started playing my song and thing, my roles just went up, you know. My music with the movies turned out to be great. You know, a lot of people recognize the movies and they recognize the song. My best experience was uh, Tom Hank, Forrest Gump. But I didn't know what I do was, was going to come out like it did, you know, with uh, Forrest Gump. Dinah, Lost Boys, yeah, that, that tickled me, you know, when the little boy was in the tub singing Ain't Got No Home. and Rage in Harlem, and a lot of them, you know, Blueberry Hill, they got a lot of movies. Then Mickey Blue Eye, my song is in that one. I have two songs in that one. And uh, Casino, when the guy go to hit the guy over the head with the telephone, ain't got no home is playing in that one. Mm -hmm. What happened in uh, 2005 with Katrina, my daughter and about 17 of us, we left a Sunday before Katrina. We was going to Memphis. We thought we, for just like the storm before, a week before, that uh, we would stay up there for about three days and come back home because all I took was shorts and a shirt and it was a t-shirt. And come to find out, we stayed up in Memphis a whole month. Enjoyed it. The people in Memphis treated us real nice. Some of the department stores gave us a, a percentage off whatever we buy, you know. And uh, I come back home a month later and come to find out the piano that I had bought when I was 15 years old. <laughs> It was torn to stretch with the water had gotten into it. I, I went up to New York. I played there. I had four engagements in, in uh, Portsmouth, Virginia. That, I, that was my last show on the road. And then I did the Jazz Fest, New Orleans Jazz Fest, about two years ago. And that was my last job that I did because I retired and I figured that I had enough and I'm, my health is, is deteriorating, you know. My legs are gone <laughs> and my hands, I can't play the piano like I used to, you know. Because I used to play the piano and make it cry. And uh, it was glad when I got off it. This street of tears that's long and dark which I wrong with a broken heart but my arms still tied can't wake from sleep like me 